Right, well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, this is a talk on perhaps the most ambitious new aspect of C Sharp 8, uh, which is nullable references. And uh, the key thing about this talk, because I know you had, I think, John Skeet come a while ago to tell you about this when it was still in preview, um, the unique selling point of this talk is I've actually been using it. So this is not just a theoretical talk. I'm going to talk initially, the first half is going to be all about what the feature is, what it offers, how it works, and then the second half is what it's like to use in practice. Things you will need to know uh, to be able to migrate to it successfully, the problems you're likely to come across and ways of working around them or dealing with them. So this means that unusually the gratuitous self-promotion slide is slightly more relevant than normal because um, this is, uh, the, the talk is based on stuff that I actually do. So I'm Ian Griffiths. I am in tiny, tiny writing, it turns out, from our official slide deck. Um, I am a technical fellow at a company called Engine. We are a smallish consulting firm. Uh, we specialize in um, cloud-based transformation and all sorts of data processing. Our unofficial thing is we help small teams achieve big things. But basically, I am in charge of technical oversight of all of our work. So one of the things we've been spearheading is the application of nullable types across all of the IP that we develop internally, all the libraries that we've written, many of which we've open sourced. So you can go and take a look at some of this stuff if you want to. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Also, I have a book to plug. Uh, in fact, I've bought two copies of the book with me, and I will be giving them out to people who would like to ask questions. Questions of the form, please can I have a free copy of your book, will, will not count. But um, if you'd like a book, um, please ask a question. If you don't want a book, but want to ask a question anyway, then don't let that stop you. The book is not mandatory. But yes, I, I am here to, to plug my book, so I may mention it a few times. So. It is programming C-sharp. It's, it's about C-sharp. It does what it says in the title. Anyway, so as I said, the first half of the talk is going to be, well, that's nice. My screens have got out of sync. Never mind. I'll look at that one. Uh, the first half of this talk, prior to pizza, is going to be the theory. What is the problem that this new language feature is designed to solve? What is nullable references for? How do they help? What are the new language features that, that um, comprise this new thing? And then after the break, we'll look at how you can tackle the task of migrating an existing code base that does not use this feature onto using this feature, because it's not totally straightforward. Um, this feature is actually switched off by default because uh, it is not entirely backwards compatible. So we'll look at how that works in practice. So what is this all about? There is a thing that a computer scientist, British computer scientist called Tony Hoare, invented, which he now describes as his billion dollar mistake. Uh, this is an estimate. He reckons it's somewhere between um, $100 million and $10 billion. But you know, a large amount of money has been caused by his decision to allow references to refer to things that aren't there. So this dates back to the 1960s. He was working on a language called Algol W. And because it was easy and convenient, he said, well, variables that refer to a thing can also be set into a state where they don't refer to a thing. And that's null. And it's propagated throughout loads of languages. C Sharp has this. Many of the C family languages have this. Anything that was influenced by Algol, which is a whole raft of languages, have this feature. Many languages don't, by the way. A popular joke amongst F sharp developers is what can C sharp do that F sharp can't? And the answer is crash with a null reference exception. <laughs> so some languages, I mean, it's not strictly true. You can do that in F sharp because it interrupts with .NET. But the default is things are not nullable unless you say they can be nullable. Haskell has the same characteristic. And it means you can't make mistakes like this. What is wrong with this code? What does this do wrong? Thank you very much. It will go bang here. When we try and dereference this argument, piece of string, um, it will go bang because we're passing in null. It will fail. So that is not good. And it's very easy to make these mistakes. It's fairly easy to spot on this slide because this fits on a slide. Not all enterprise applications fit on one slide. So there might sometimes be difficulties in working out whether the thing here has a possibility of being null. 
And this is what the new language feature in C-sharp 8, known cryptically as nullable references, that's what it's there to try and solve. So the idea is that if you turn this feature on, this is how you turn it on, by the way, you go into your properties project file and add a nullable property and set that to enable. That will fully turn the feature on. And when you do this, you'll get complaints if you do things you're not supposed to. We get a squiggly underneath the null here saying that's not right. You should not be passing in a null here because that method can't cope with nulls. That method expects there definitely to be a string there. So this is essentially the promise. The compiler is going to tell us, we hope, when we've made mistakes of this kind. Question? That looks great. Is this the end of the talk? Is that, <laughs> that looks great. Is this the end of the talk? Well, I would say that would have become self-evident had you not asked the question. Um, I'm not sure that counts as a technical question. So unless you're deeply offended, that's not enough to get a book. Why is that not the end of the talk? This is not a net win, necessarily. There are, there's one obvious benefit, which is it will start to tell you about null-related errors. There are less obvious benefits. Actually, one of the big benefits that we have found as we've moved code over to this mechanism is that it improves the expressiveness of your code base because your code base tells you more. So today, if you've got a .NET library that's got some property of some object, you don't necessarily know whether it's going to be null or not. You can't tell. But once you've gone through the process of upgrading your code to use this stuff, it's unambiguous. Either it says, yes, this definitely can be null, or it says, no, this will not be null, or it should not be null. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Could versus won't turns out to be a bit of a sticky detail of all of this. So it means there's a lot more information in your code base. And we, we were surprised actually by how big a difference that made in practice. We sort of knew in theory this would be the case, but the reality has been a pleasant surprise, I would say, so far. So what's the problem? Well, the first thing that will happen when you turn this on is it generates an enormous amount of work for you. So you'll turn it on and suddenly thousands of new warnings, or well, it depends how big your project is maybe a handful of warnings, maybe hundreds, possibly thousands, depending on how you structure your code, of warnings saying, well, this either isn't right or needs some work. And in a lot of cases, it's because you need to go and add the information that the compiler needs to do its job. For example, if you use optional arguments in C Sharp, if you declare any function that takes optional arguments and the default value that you specify is null, you're going to have to go and modify all of those to say this is nullable because the default is non-nullable. So you're going to have to make changes all over the place just to, to get past the point where it will compile. And then it will give you a bunch of warnings, many of which will actually be maybe not real problems at all. As we're going to see, this is not perfect because fundamentally what the C-sharp team have tried to do here is retrofit a fundamental language feature to a language and runtime that's already about 20 years old, which is courageous, I would say. It's, um, it's not been straightforward, and so that there are plenty of rough edges. And actually, the biggest issue that we have encountered is that certain common practices in .NET just don't fit that well with this new approach. The, the big one being deserialization scenarios of one kind or another. Now, there are ways around this, and I will talk about them, but, but this is a big problem that you will run into in practice, is not everything actually likes being in this sort of a world. Because this was retrofitted, they can't guarantee anything. So the first thing to be aware of is that nothing is guaranteed. Yes? So what happens in, like, um, if you're using a third-party library that doesn't normally subscribe, subscribe to this uh, by default, could you then end up having null, what would happen if a null was returned from a method that's in another library then? Right, yes. So what would happen if you're using, if you've turned on this language feature, but you're using a library that does not support it, which is going to be the case, right? Yeah. Because most things don't support it, right? Someone has to start. And unless the entire world agrees, the strict dependency tree of all .NET code ever written yeah. and upgrades it in order, which probably won't happen, then yes, this, this is a scenario you'll definitely come across. One of the issues is that C Sharp might, simply might not know about certain expressions, whether, whether they're meant to be null or not. As we're going to see, it categorizes expressions. And one of the categorizations is what's called oblivious. 
<laughs> which is basically this thing doesn't even know what null is. So nullable, sorry, is. doesn't know what the distinction means. And so you just can't infer anything. And in those cases, it simply disables the warnings. So you don't get the warnings, but you also don't get to know that there's a problem. So that, that's the answer, is that it's essentially a bit of a black hole. Um, and they had to do it that way, because the alternative would be either somehow you would have to be able to layer annotations on top of someone else's component, which you, there's no way of doing that. They haven't provided a mechanism for that. Or you just get loads of warnings and would have to then do things to suppress them one way or another, which would be equally annoying. So they've taken the decision that there is such a thing as being oblivious to whether something is null or not, and that sort of spreads outwards unless you take steps to stop it doing that, which I also talk about. So other components will not necessarily have been upgraded to this. Also, the runtime has not changed. This is not a .NET feature in the sense that the runtime's type system, the CTS, has not been augmented to understand this. I think the .NET team would argue with me on this. They say, well, it is a .NET feature because C -sharp, Sharp's a .NET language and the .NET tool chain supports this. But it's certainly not part of the CLR. It is part of the .NET ecosystem, but it's not part of the CLR itself. And so the CLR can't tell you when, that, when these things have gone wrong. All of the analysis that this new language feature enables happens at, um, at, at, at compile time. There's no runtime checks. And one of the consequences of this is it's really easy to subvert them. In fact, let me, right, I'm going to type it and hope the PowerPoint is back to life by the time I return. So if I write, how long is a string brackets piece of, nope, not that. I'm not used to typing at this angle. Um, piece of dot length, and let's reproduce the error. So, so far no errors because I have not turned on the language feature. But if I turn on the language feature, so I come into my project file, and somewhere in a property group I say nullable, notice that for some reason this doesn't show up in IntelliSense, don't know why, um, to make demos harder, I guess. Enable it, come back here, and wait for a little bit. There we go. So now, unfortunately, I was un unable to crank up the font size of my tooltip. So I'm going to zoom in there and try and move that. Oop. So you can see it. Right, there we go. Uh, cannot convert null literal to non-nullable reference type. So basically, th this is the point of this, right? This is why we're doing this. So this is the goal, is to be told when we've done something wrong. So we obviously have to pass in something that at least resembles a meaningful value. I foresee a future in which lots of people just pass empty strings instead of null strings, <laughs> thus completely defeating the entire purpose of the exercise. Hey, we've got two kinds of null. Let's just use the other one. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> but like I said, it's quite easy to subvert this. If I am just a little bit more emphatic about it and stick an exclamation mark on the end, then it goes, oh, that's fine then. This, the exclamation mark, is called the null forgiving operator. <laughs> also known informally as the damn it operator. So rather than this, you say this, damn it, and that's an assertion that this is definitely not null, despite, I would say, quite strong evidence to the contrary. That, that, that I think that probably is null. Does WTF count as a question? <laughs> Does WTF count as a question? I think I, I, I'm looking for questions with, with some technical Follow up, yes. <laughs> it might be pretty basic, but if you to find a string and set its value as null and then pass it in, mm -hmm. at, at which level does that flag as I'm not happy with it? Uh, if I simply have a string and set that to null and then pass that in, is that a devious way of bypassing this? So if I have some string, definitely not null. Oops. Ooh, no. And I pass that in, then it's happy. If I set this to null, the problem now is underscored here. So when you declare a variable, 
you express whether it's allowed to be null. And actually, it's smarter than that. It turns out the C compiler has noticed what I've done. Because as I'm going to talk about in a minute, the C sharp compiler doesn't just take our word for it. It actually does some, a certain amount of flow analysis to work out what it thinks is the status of things. So it will go, well, hang on. You may have declared that as non-nullable. I, I know I've not introduced the syntax yet, but that definitely means non-nullable. If I wanted to be nullable, I would write that. That's a nullable string. Now it's no longer complaining about the initialization because it's like, what's well, fine? I'm allowed to put null into this variable because it says it's nullable, but now I'm not allowed to pass it as, ar as that argument unless I decide I do want to, in which case <laughs> I, can, I can bypass it. I'll explain, I, I'm going to get to why that's useful. There's, there, there are actually good reasons for doing that occasionally. Yes? What happens if you put a dot two value on that? Does that... Oh, two, uh, as in um, like with a nullable int? Yeah, dot value, sorry. It's not the same thing as a nullable int. <laughs> Same syntax, entirely different. That, that's a great question. Uh, you'll have to come to whatever my next talk is, and I'll owe you a book or something. Uh, anyway, so you can defeat this, and I'm going to talk about the mechanisms that will explain why all this stuff that appears to render it all entirely pointless is not actually the end of the world. So let me see if PowerPoint's woken up again. Oh, my word, this is going to be fun. So yes, no guarantees, as I've just demonstrated. OK, well, let's look at what we've actually got, because I've just shown you a random smattering of what happens. Let's get a little bit more formal about this. Here is how things look when you've turned the new feature on. You have explicit nullability for reference types such as string in kind of the same way as you have with value types. So with value types, since C sharp 2, you have been able to stick a question mark on then to say, actually, this might not be here. So with value types, it was always a case of this thing's definitely present unless I say explicitly it's nullable. And so the theory is that we now get to do the same thing with references. However, what they haven't done is introduced a new nullable ref of t that's kind of the reference type equivalent of nullable of t, because this is backed by a generic type called nullable of t. And you can do nullable of int, nullable of any value type. And that says, OK, this is that value type, but possibly null. For all the Haskell programmers in the room, it's like the maybe type. It's, sort of, it's a thing that can be one of two states. The intention is the same with this. And if they were designing this in from the start of .NET, they probably would have made it work in a much more similar way. These would have been the same thing. The problem is they can't really do that, because all the .NET code already out there doesn't know what this hypothetical nullable ref of t would be. It needs, yeah, the only things that, 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 the only kind of type you can use, the only thing that's able to work with existing code is the good old reference we've been using since .NET 1. And so this is just a syntactic thing. This is a, in the C-sharp compiler's head. Both of these types, string or nullable string, both of them actually end up meaning the same thing to the CLR, and that thing is exactly what string always used to mean before this language feature came along. One of the reasons that's important is that if that wasn't the case, turning this on would break all of your code more or less straight away because it would completely change the meaning. So they just decided this is not going to be completely consistent with how nullable value types have typically worked in the past. This also means that even though they've tried to keep things as similar as possible for backwards compatibility, Nevertheless, it means that this is quite a dramatic change, turning it on. Because I've had to do what this used to mean before and how it's changed columns there. Well, the, va the value types haven't changed. Normal value types and nullable value types, nothing new here for that. But with reference types, notice this maybe null has moved down a line. So before, if you wrote string, reference to a string or null, that's what that meant. It was either a reference to a string or it was a reference to nothing. Whereas now, we have a new syntax that means the old thing, which, by the way, explains the rather cryptic name for this technology. So it's called nullable references. It's like, well, hang on, haven't we always had them? References have been nullable since .NET 1. That's always been a feature. How is this a new feature? Well, the new thing is the new syntax for that. And rather more dramatically, the fundamental change in what the old syntax means. Now, the old syntax means, I don't want this ever to be null, please. So that's the new syntax, but there's also 
some new features because the compiler is able to infer whether things are null or not. Take a look at this code. We've got our old how long is a piece of string down at the bottom, which still requires a non-nullable string. But here, I've got a wrapper function called how many, wrapper method called how many characters, which takes a nullable string. And this is saying, well, if I've been passed a null, then I'm just going to say, well, you've not given me a string. Question. So what's the default of a string question mark? What is the default va value for string question mark? Or what's the, so the default value the, the keyword default will be null. What does it, what does it for string question mark, it's null. So if I can. Uh, and, and when you enable the feature, the default for string. <laughs> Excellent question. I should have brought more books, but I was, <laughs> came in public transport. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. So this is exactly what you'd expect. It defaults to null. So the obvious question is what happens? The answer is, the answer is you're not allowed to do that. Because default actually doesn't have a meaning really in the world of references if, if they can't be null. What, what could it refer to? So yeah, that's the answer. So let me back up. So here, we check for null, and if it's null, we do something. Otherwise, I've passed in the argument to the function that requires a null. And what's interesting is this doesn't cause an error. You might think it would, because here, the function being called says, got to have a non-nullable string. And the variable I'm passing in is declared as nullable. How can that work? And the answer is the compiler does flow control analysis, flow analysis, sorry, um, in using basically the same system that it uses to check that you've initialized your variables. It's basically the same inference engine that is, was, has always been used for a definite assignment has now been repurposed to do this. Uh, question. Can reflection APIs discover the nullability? Yes, it's all done through custom attributes. So you can find out that way. Um, now, you can see what the compiler has inferred because if you mouse over any um, expression that is of reference type, um, actually strictly any variable reference, it will tell you whether it thinks it might be null. So you can see in the, in the uh, pop-up there, it says piece of is not null here. Even though it was declared as nullable, the compiler goes, well, hang on, you've tested it for null. We could only end up here if it's not null. And so I now know that in this line, it's not null. And so it's OK to pass it as an argument. So we have the declared nullability, but we also have the inferred nullability. And those are not always the same. And actually, earlier, I showed you the converse of this. I had an argument that was declared as being non-nullable. I then tested it for null, set it to null. And the compiler goes, well, obviously, that's null. I'm going to ignore your variable declaration. And I can see you've put null in there. So it's definitely not non-null. And it is that way. It doesn't have any notion of definitely null. It has two ideas. The inference says either it's definitely not null or it's not definitely not null. It may be null. That's the language they use. Either it's definitely null or it may be null. Now, you can help it here. Here's an interesting case. This is almost exactly the same code as the last slide. But rather than comparing for null, I am using null or white space, which is a library function. And if you compile this code on .NET Core 3.0 or later, or .NET Standard 2.1 or later, this will continue to work. It will continue to tell you that piece of is not null here, and therefore it will let you pass it as an argument. If, however, you compile this against .NET Standard 2.0, it is unable to make that inference. What's the difference? Well, the library function in question is null or white space has been annotated with an attribute telling the compiler what it's allowed to infer. Not null when. When what? When the return value from the function is whatever's passed in here. So this says if this function returns false, you can safely conclude that this argument is not null. So in essence, it enables it to infer the same thing that it would have inferred if I'd explicitly tested for null. 
So it basically says, I'm doing a null test for you so that you can flow that out. Question. Have they extended that to the null co co coalescing um, operator? Well, the null, yes, the, the, the null coalescing operator works even if you're targeting .NET standard 2.0. Can you use it is null on white space to um, coalesce the null rather than having to write it out? You, uh, you can't use the null coalescing operator on this because this returns a bool. There's a bunch of attributes you can add to your code, and the .NET framework class, the .NET class libraries have also been annotated with these um, in .NET Core 3 slash .NET Standard 2.1 or later. And if you've got those things, then the inference gets a whole lot better. So we have the type system and also the inferred information. They're two separate things the compiler has access to. So the types are just how is this variable or argument or property or field declared? Was it declared as non-nullable? So I've enabled nullability and I've not stuck a question mark on the end. Or was it declared as nullable? I've enabled nullability and I have uh, have stuck a question mark on the end. Is the C-sharp compiler, sorry, is the, the thing in question oblivious to nullability? So did I get this from some library component that was built without nullability enabled? In which case, it's like, well, this is unknowable. And then unknown for obscure cases I won't go into where it can't tell for other reasons what the, what the situation is. So these are the type system in C Sharp. .NET's type system hasn't changed. It's all actually done through attributes and convention. But in the C Sharp world, this is now part of the type system for reference types. And additionally, we have the dynamically determined not null or maybe null-ness um, of each point of use of any particular null, nullable, potentially nullable variable. So those are the, the fundamentally the language mechanisms. Now, I showed you how to switch this on by setting enabled in the project file. You may find that causes a terrifying cascade of warnings and looks completely intractable. And you might go, oh, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. So there are other ways you can do this. You don't have to turn everything on at once. You can, for example, say, I am not ready to annotate my code, so I would like all of my code to remain in an oblivious state, but I'd still like to see warnings that tell me that I have misused other people's fully null aware code. So if I'm using you know, .NET Standard 2.1, I'd like to be told if I've messed up, but I'm not ready to annotate my own code yet. That's what you get if you say, just warnings, please. Conversely, you can say, I'd like to annotate my code now, but I get a terrifying cascade of warnings when I turn that on. So I'd just like to add the annotations, and I'll deal with the warnings later, in which case you can say, just turn on the annotations. And you don't have to do this at the entire project level if you don't want to. You can set this at every single line of code if you want to. There is a hash nullable directive where you can enable or disable or undo the last thing you did with a restore either the annotations or the warnings. Now, the terminology around this is horrible, but I've been unable to think of a way they could have named it better. So they, they have this really bizarre language. Each line of code exists in two nullable contexts. It is in a nullable warning context, and it is in a nullable annotation context. The nullable warning context can be either enabled or disabled, and so can the nullable annotation context. This is, this is how they've defined it. So for any line of code, you can say, this line of code is in an enabled nullable warning context and a disabled nullable annotation context, or vice versa. Question. Given that you've used this extensively, don't you, I mean, um, C Sharp is the first language to try and bring in this concept of having non-nullables. I did some Swift development a few years back, which also introduced that as a, as a concept. Uh -huh. Doesn't this feel really, really overcomplicated? Because um, the way that I'd seen it done in Swift was you didn't have to change the entire project landscape in order to enable it. Do it on a per, um, basically property definition from that, from that perspective, and then you're essentially able to mix your nullables and non nullables in the same code base without having all these errors and warnings and scary stuff going on. So you can sequentially change your code base to that. So I'm unfamiliar with this bit of with Swift. I've done, uh, so do, does Swift have like different syntaxes for I'm u I'm using this and I'm not? So it would the exclamation. Um, Character that you put in, which then tells when you, when you bring it around null, which was then fooling the uh, the compiler yeah. that it actually is null. They would you'd have to declare that on the actual property itself. So you go string exclamation mark. Mm -hmm. So they, have, they would have string string exclamation mark and then the string question. Mark. Right. 
Okay, this is what I was wondering. They got three syntaxes. They have a different syntax for obliv oblivious. So the old syntax means oblivious. Right. I think there's a, there's a good reason they've not done this, because they did explore this. They did explore putting an exclamation mark on the end to mean definitely not null. So that was one of the options that was considered. The reason they've not done this is that in practice, most places where your code today defines an existing reference type property field argument whatever, probably doesn't want to be nullable. And this has certainly been our experience. The vast majority, we actually don't change the code. We accept the change in meaning because that accurately expresses what was already implicitly the case. And the, the number that we change is relatively small. So, so I guess, I mean, this just feels a lot more scary than that mechanism. Um, I, I understand where you're coming from. This feels more scary because it's kind of you switch it on and everything changes. The reason they're doing this is they want this to be the new default. Yeah. The problem with the Swift way of doing it is there's a very strong incentive to leave everything in the oblivious state, and that's the problem. Question. Yeah. Really, just a question for you. Did, did, did you end up changing everything to have that? Was it beneficial? Or? Um, well, we kind of had it in hybrid because that's how you would. Like, you always have a mix of null and not null. Yes, but did you get rid of every I haven't decided case? Um, yeah, for the most part, yeah, we did. I, I guess the thing is this forces you to be more disciplined in how you do things going forward. So if you were working from a blank slate, that's where this is, I feel that this is obviously less scary because it needs you to do the right thing from the beginning. Yes. Whereas, as you said before, having a mix where you're able to introduce them as you wish doesn't really um, allow the language to enforce that behavior as a first class citizen, whereas this obviously would. And you can enable it individually. You just have to use the, the directive ra rather than expressing it through the, pure, the, the language, the type syntax. So you can have to get the same effect if you want to. Now, in practice, I, we have not used this hash nullable very much. We've actually found that, for the most part, turning it on at the project level has actually worked out fairly well for us. But we have a practice of keeping our projects on the relatively small side. So, um, so it, will, it will depend on how complex your projects are, whether you want to use this more granular stuff. One of the cases where we have wanted to use this is in places like deserializing exception constructors. Because those, the c -sharp compiler can't see what's happening inside them. They will fully populate all your fields, but the c -sharp compiler has no way of de detecting that this is going to happen. And so the simplest thing is to say, I'm just bailing out on this one and <laughs> reverting to the old behavior. Trust me, it's fine. Will this be enabled uh, by default in the future? Will it be enabled by default in the future? Microsoft has said they would like to do that. I am not convinced they will ever be able to do that. I don't know. I suspect they might try turning it on with new project templates. I think that would be the obvious first step. And then maybe it will become a default. But unless there's some big breaking change, you know, maybe four years' time they'll decide to reinvent the project system again, and that will be the big opportunity to do this. But let's hope not, eh? Uh, yes? Well, I don't think it's a done in fiber, because I guess the problem really is, as you, the reason why they haven't done this way on the standard 2.0 is because of the bridge with 462. That would open up the whole... <laughs> Actually, no, it doesn't because you can actually you can actually use this on .NET framework because it's just just a bunch of attributes. Yeah, it doesn't require anything in the runtime, so you can use this on .NET. I think it's more just if they turned it on right now, would, everything would break and no one would no one would use C Sharp eight at all. So um, yes, I don't know. I don't know when they were, if or when they will make this the default default. But I could see project templates changing to enable this by default. That would be the obvious next step. So let's just quickly go through the attributes since I'm talking about what you can do. There's, um, so you can constrain inputs to functions. Why on earth would you need an attribute to do that? Why don't I just write string or string question mark depending on whether I want nulls or not? Yes, unless you're using generics. Generics prove to be a massive headache in all of this because the compiler doesn't even know whether the, the T you're looking at is a value type or a reference type. And so uh, the syntax that we use with reference types all just goes to pieces as soon as you've introduced um, the possibility that it could be anything there. And so we fall back to using attributes. If you want to write a function which is able to take a value and which can't take a non-null uh, reference, well, actually, you can constrain the type argument with the new non-null constraint. That's one option. Um, but there are situations where you might possibly not want to do that, because you might want to say, this argument's allowed to be null, that one's not, and they're both of type T. 
now you can't do that with a generic constraint. So then you can do it with allow null. And there's also disallow null to say, no, no matter what the person tries to pass in here as the type argument, I don't want to allow a null in this particular place. So generally, you only ever use these in generics, because if you're not using generics, you can just specify it directly with the type in question. Um, there are also, as you've just seen, attributes that influence the inference system. So, so the thing that works out whether something might be null at any particular point in the code. So there's maybe null when, which we saw on the uh, is null or empty or white space or whatever, uh, based on the return result. And there's a not null when as well. So you can say this is definitely not null if and only if the return value is this. Um, and also, there are ones for out and ref values. So this is the one that makes dictionaries usable in this world. Because the problem with my dictionary.try get value is that you kind of want that to return null when there's nothing in there with the right key. But you'd really like it to be definitely not null if it actually retrieves a value from the dictionary. And to make that work, you can't declare that in the, in the signature of the type. Um, so that they do that with attributes. So. Um, you can say just maybe null, not null for out values, or not null if not null. You can say this thing will not be null if this other thing is not null. So if you passed in a non-null thing here, you get out a non-null thing there. So null in, null out, non-null in, non-null out, so to speak. So that just says I'm passing this through. And you can also use, uh, I think it's that one, you can also use that for out values as well as your return type. And there is this generic constraint of not null to say, I don't mind if t is a value type or a reference type, but whatever it is, I don't want it to be null ever anywhere in this generic thing. This is a simple thing. This is a method that uses t just once as the argument. So that's straightforward. The attributes come in where t pops up in several different places and might have different characteristics in different places. But if always got to be non null, you can do this. Right, so the just to repeat the question for the room, what's, it, what's the story if I am targeting multiple versions of multiple frameworks? Can I really use this if I'm writing a library where I need to target .NET Standard 2.0, for example, if that's a requirement for me? Um, yes, you can. Just life is not quite as good. So we do exactly this. So we have a couple of, several libraries that we multi-target on, where we have a version that targets .NET Standard 2.1, but also 2.0 because we need down-level support. Um, and for various reasons, we need to do both because we're using, that doesn't matter, the details are irrelevant. We do it. So, um, so the thing you lose is that you don't get as much help when you're calling into library functions. So you end up using the damn it operator an awful lot more than you would do. So if you go and look at um, Engine's open source code base, um, you will find quite a few places where there's an, an exclamation mark followed by a comment saying we have to do this because we're targeting .NET Standard 2.0. And the reason I've put those comments in there is so I can go find them on the happy, happy day that we no longer have to support .NET Standard 2.0. So, so yes, the, um, it's more work specifically in those cases. So things like using dictionaries, you just have to assert this is definitely not null to the compiler, say, I know what I'm doing. I know in this situation this won't be null, so trust me. And, and then it will help you again. Once you've, once you've plugged the gap for it, then the inference takes over, and, and it's happy thereafter. You don't have to do the exclamation mark again and again and again and again and again. Doing it once is typically enough. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not horrible. It's irksome, I would say, but it's, it's absolutely possible to do that. And how far back, like .NET 451 maybe? <sighs> I've never tried it on .NET 451. I don't know of a reason why it wouldn't work on .NET 451, because it's literally all just attributes. And when it comes to those annotations, you can bring your own copy. You don't have to use the ones in the class library. And if you go to NuGet, you will find there's a package whose name is Nullable, which is a source code only NuGet package. It doesn't have any DLLs at all. But if you are targeting a version of .NET that does not have nullable support built in yet, it adds a source code file to your project that defines local copies of all of the missing attributes. So you can even annotate your own code with those attributes that don't exist yet in the framework you're using. And the compiler doesn't care because the compiler just says, as long as the attribute has this name and this namespace, I will treat it as that attribute. It doesn't have to be the one from a particular component. So that, that's a huge help, because that means you can have, 
you can have a component that targets .NET 2.0 be fully annotated, and then another one that uses that can use that as well. So throughout your own code base, it actually works pretty well. It's just when you hit the boundaries where you don't have that. Question. What sort of scale have you been doing this on? How much code is it? How long? How many developers? What kind of, you know, just, just give us a sense of the... It's, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's massive. We've probably um, had uh, six developers involved on the project to move things over to this so far. So th this is not, we, we, what we haven't done is a kind of, you know, 200 person um, major project. So, um, and uh, I, I don't know how to answer the rest of that without breaking an NDA, but. Um, no, 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 but I just, that's just what I don't even know how big the company is. I don't know what kind of engineering, if it, 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 just a bit of background. Yeah, okay, so does that, does, does that number I am able to tell you give you a sort of rough idea of the scale? It's not. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the practical issues that we have encountered actually trying to use these nullable language features in practice. So, when you turn this feature on, you're going to see something of this kind. A big pile of either warnings or, in our case, errors, because we generally run with, er with warnings as errors turned on. The default is there'll, there'll be warnings rather than errors, but yes. Loads and loads and loads and loads of things saying this doesn't look right. Now, the first thing you may have to ask yourself is actually where do I even start with this? Um, we found that if uh, there's various ways you can tackle this. You can start with any library. It doesn't have to be kind of transitive. It's not like async was. So the async language features were one of these things where once you change it here, it rattles all the way up through the stack. So it's kind of all or nothing. So this is not like that. It is entirely possible to turn on the uh, nullable references feature at the leaves of your dependency tree and not do anything else. It's in also entirely possible to turn them on at the top as well. Anywhere in the food chain, you can switch this on at any time. Um, we tried various things. We actually tried a few different approaches. What happens if we just dive right into the middle? Is that better or worse than going right to the bottom? But typically, we tend to find, unsurprisingly, that if you dive right into the middle, you get this sort of picture, whereas projects that are sort of down at the leaves of the dependency hierarchy tend to be slightly easier to, to cope with. So th this is a real one. Uh, one of our projects had exactly one uh, error in it from this feature. Um, it's, uh, your mileage will vary. Yeah, here's another one that was also at the leaves of the tree, had a few more. Um, but we generally found, and this is sort of unsurprising and perhaps obvious, but it's useful to know that this was the reality as well as the expectation, we tended to find that um, it's best to start at the kind of leaves of the tree. Because if you don't, if you tackle something in the middle and then later on, you, t you change one of the projects it depends on, you often have to come back and revisit the first one you did anyway, because now the compiler has a bunch more information. So this component in the middle, which is using this one down here, you change this one here to have more nullability annotations, and now this one's going, oh, now I can see that thing's definitely meant to be null. I can tell you you've definitely made a mistake here, whereas it couldn't do that before. Having said that, it's not always this way around. We did find examples where actually the converse happened where we discovered that we hadn't done quite a good enough job at the sort of leaves of our dependency hierarchy as a result of turning the feature on further up. We discovered that there were cases where actually we should have declared things as nullable when, uh, when we hadn't done initially. So this is an important point, actually, is that the warnings alone don't tell you everything. Just because you've got everything to compile without warning doesn't necessarily mean that you are done. All it means is that the compiler can no longer see any problems. Um, but you might not necessarily have correctly expressed reality. Because the goal with the annotations, whether you're using just the question mark or not, or whether you are using the attributes, the goal is to describe how a component's meant to be used. And it's easy to get that wrong. If you fail to mark something as nullable when it should be, it's, that doesn't always show up until something else tries to use it. So sometimes, bottom-up doesn't actually work. You, it's iterative. It tends to be a bit of churn until you get the whole thing, thing right. That's the kind of what order did I do things in. Now let's talk about .NET Standard 2.0. Now I've sort of tipped my hand a bit on this because we already had some questions. But uh, let's look at this. So what does work? What if you need to target .NET Standard 2.0? And most of our libraries do. 
um, either because they were already being used in projects uh, that were targeting .NET Core 2.1 or even .NET Framework, or just because we've got customers who aren't ready to move to .NET Core 3.1 yet. Even now, there are problems deploying web apps to Azure App Service with .NET Core 3.1. There are certain scenarios in which that just doesn't work. So although .NET Core 3.1 has been in general availability for quite some time now, there are things that don't work. And so sometimes you just have to support the down-level stuff because something in your ecosystem might not be ready to move on. So fortunately, you can do it. You can turn on the feature. You can say, I'm using C Sharp version 8. Uh, you will have to say, I'd like to use the latest version of C-sharp in your project settings and also enable the nullability feature as well. But it lets you do this. It doesn't care whether you're targeting .NET 3 or whatever. It lets you do it. Once you've done that, you can stick the question mark on types that are meant to be null. That all works. And you can even apply the attributes. As I mentioned earlier, there is this nullable library. That's its name, nullable. Not something .nullable, just nullable in NuGet, which adds in definitions of all of the attributes we talked about in the previous half, making it possible to do this. Also, even when annotations are not available, so if you are consuming a library that has not been redeveloped with nullable awareness, which will obviously be the case for the entire .NET Framework class library, if you're targeting .NET to, uh, standard 2.0, if you're using libraries that have not moved into this world, um, then that limits the inference, but it doesn't mean it can't do anything. It's still able to work things out just from what your code is doing. So, but you will find certain things are more irksome to you. So the string dot is null or empty that I showed earlier, that's problematic. Also, dictionaries are a bit of a bugbear because um, you never, well, the compiler can't tell that when try get value return true, you've definitely got a thing. It just doesn't know that. And so you end up using more of the nullable annotation, the, sorry, the exclamation mark thing, the uh, null forgiving operator. So this will be problematic in .NET Standard 2.0. This does not work because the .NET Standard 2.0 version of that library function is null or empty, has not been suitably annotated. But this, which is functionally equivalent, will work. So this says if this argument has a length and the length is greater than zero, then we'll end up in this one because I've inverted it. Without, that's a logical not. That's not the null forgiving operator. Um, but this basically ends up doing the same thing as that. This, of course, is completely unreadable. This is exactly why C family languages have a reputation for being terse and difficult to get to grips with. I would much rather write this, but the nice thing about doing it by hand is that the compiler can see what you're doing. The compiler understands what the question mark dot operator means. It understands that this will produce a nullable int because you're retrieving a length of a thing that might not be there. And so it knows that if that comparison succeeds, it must be that there was a value there. And so you can only end up in that branch if that was not null. So it's, the inference is actually quite good, but it can't do it if it can't see inside the function. And that really is the main issue with .NET Standard 2.0. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Here's the big one. Properties of serializable types. You will probably have quite a lot of this warning in your future, CS8618. Um, it's actually a warning about a constructor. It's telling you that your constructor has not initialized all of your fields. So one of, at least that's normally where it crops up, if I go into Visual Studio, um, and if I define a new class called imaginatively class one, if I declare this with a couple of props, oops, no, not one of those, prop, String name and prop string favorite color. And you might not have one of those, so I'm going to say that is allowed to be null. So one of those gets a squiggly. The other one doesn't. And the squiggly in this case says non-nullable property name is uninitialized. Consider declaring the property as nullable. That is not a helpful suggestion. 
something. Yeah, sure. Let's just make everything nullable. There we go. All, the, all your problems will go away, except now you'll get lots of errors when you try and use it, and you'll have no information about what the intent was, thus throwing away one of the big benefits of this. Now, you don't always get the error here. I can move this error. If I have a constructor, there we go. I've fixed the problem with my property. It's no longer giving me a squiggly. So there's the answer. Always declare a constructor. Well, that is part of the answer. Now it's saying, well, apart from remove redundant constructor, ignore that one. Non-nullable property name is uninitialized. The error is moved up here. And actually, that's where the error really belongs. It's just that if you don't define a constructor, it can't annotate it with a warning, so it moves it down to the property instead. Fundamentally, what's actually happened here is that the rules, if you've enabled nullability, the rules are any field that is declared to be non-nullable must be initialized to a value that is definitely not null in all of your constructors. That's the rule. So it's actually got nothing to do with properties. This is an auto property. It has the side effect of generating a field called blah, 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 favorite color. It's a, an unspeakable name. Um, so something, 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 favorite color as the backing store for these get accesses. And what's really going on is that my constructor has not initialized that. And that's not allowable. Because that means I've not met the, sorry, not that one. That's the one that's going to cause the error, obviously. Um, this one's fine. It's allowed to be null. This is the one that must be initialized. It's not allowable for that thing to return null. And therefore, this thing is required somehow to give it a value. That's the standard American passport filling for no first name, in case you're wondering. <laughs> teller of Penn and Teller, the magicians, has that on his passport, I'm informed, because he genuinely has no first name, apparently, although that might not actually be true. Anyway, so you see this a lot, because the problem is, as someone asked earlier, what is the default for uh, a non-nullable string? Well, there isn't generally a good default. There might be a domain-specific default that is acceptable, but in general, there isn't a good default for this. So what do we do about this? That's the problem. What do we do? This crops up quite a lot. This will crop up if you are using, for example, JSON.NET in its most commonly used style. Some of you may be thinking, this doesn't have to be a problem. And you're right, it doesn't have to be a problem. But most people seem to use JSON.NET in a particular way, which is to declare a bunch of properties and then allow JSON.NET to fill those in. So the old order is construct the object and then populate all its properties. This is fundamentally incompatible with the way that nullable types wants to guarantee non-nullness. This also crops up with the entity framework for precisely the same reasons. It also crops up with iConfiguration binding. If you're using the Microsoft.Extensions.Configuration components, which is the standard way of configuring stuff in ASP.NET applications, ASP.NET Core applications, you might be using binding, which is a means of saying, I'd like to define all my properties, all, all my config settings as an object with properties, and it will automatically load that out of your JSON or out of your Azure app settings or wherever your settings may be stored and plug those in. And all of these share this, this characteristic whereby you construct the object and then you set its properties. And that just doesn't work if you want to have this new language feature. This is a hard problem. This is one of the upshots of going 20 years later, oh, yeah, we should have done this as a fundamental feature of the language 20 years ago. Oh, well. Um, there isn't really a particularly good solution to this, I'm afraid. There are several okay-ish solutions that I will present to you in order of how well they work. So this is a genuine example from one of our projects. So this is a, a class that gets used um, to read config data out of an iConfiguration system. And when we turned on this feature, we got a whole load of errors. <laughs> Here's a non nullable property. Here's another non nullable property. Here's another one. You haven't initialized any of them. You see a lot of this if you do this sort of code. So what do you do? Well, the very first thing you should do is say, is it actually nullable? Is that what I meant? You know, when I wrote this, did I intend for this to be nullable? So one of the things we find ourselves doing is click on the symbol, Shift F12, find all references. Is anything testing this to see if it's null? 
Oh yes, loads of code test that everything that uses this is either doing dot question mark or equals equals null or question mark question mark. Obviously, this must be a nullable thing because everything expects it to be null. That's almost certainly a no-brainer. Just stick a question mark on there, and that warning will now go away because you've identified this as being a thing that might be null. The compiler, no, the compiler will no longer be upset that you failed to initialize it because it says, well, that's fine. It doesn't need to be initialized. So that's great. It's not always completely obvious that this is the case. So we found some examples where the thing could be null, and yet none of the code looking at it ever tested for null. And this was to do with relationships between properties. It turned out that in this particular example, we had two different ways of configuring connection information. So either we could say, it's in that key vault over there with this key name, or here's the connection string, which was generally used for local development. And the connection string would be the dev connection string or whatever, yeah, it's a local instance. So um, if the key vault name was set, the key, the key name was also set. Generally speaking, if one was set, the other was set. And if one wasn't set, the other wasn't set either. So we had one null test that actually essentially applied to two different properties. Um, and so the property was allowed to be null, even though nothing ever tested for it, because we never hit the code path where it would be null, basically. So sometimes things are nullable, even though it doesn't look like they are. So this requires thought. I'm afraid. So at this point, you have to start thinking, what do I mean to say? What, what is in my intent with this property? Should this just be a thing that is allowed to be null? And if it is, great. Make it null. Your code has now expressed a thing that was previously concealed. And that is a win. What if that's not the case? What if the property in question is non-nullable? It's a thing that should always be present. This is a bad example because not everyone has first names. But imagine that this is an application where a legal requirement is all your customers have to have first names. I don't know. Let's, let's ignore the detailed problem and look at the technical side of it. So one solution to this is shown here. I've made all my properties read only. And I've forced them all to be initialized through the constructor. Actually, you don't have to do both those things. You can just say, all the properties that are non-nullable have to be initialized through the constructor. You can then choose whether or not to make them modifiable. Um, I think that immutable objects have quite a lot to like about them. They solve lots of otherwise challenging problems. So once you've done, once you've done this bit, I would say you may as well do that bit as well, because that's now become easier. However, it might be that actually you're in a situation where you always initialize it with certain values, but then sometimes change the values later. Maybe mutability is what you want. So these are really two dimensions. The fact that these are read-only is not strictly required. The important thing is I've only got constructors that fill in all of the non-nullable properties. This keeps the compiler happy. Good, because that's the most important thing. Never mind, <laughs> never mind customers, never mind your manager. As long as the compiler, well, the compiler sort of has to be happy, really, if it's going to produce our code. So, and the good thing about this is it is actually relatively well supported in popular frameworks. JSON.NET is perfectly happy to use this. Um, you can just so give it the constructor. As long as the names match, it will use the constructor if it has to. It doesn't require you to do everything through property initialization. In my experience, an awful lot of code doesn't use this, but you, you, you can. So that's fine. Uh, Entity Framework also supports this, by the way. It's perfectly happy to initialize all of your properties through a constructor rather than through property initialization. However, this is not the universal answer to this problem. For one thing, there are things that don't support this. If you're using Microsoft.Extensions.Configuration.Binder, the thing that can read stuff out of your settings source and plug them into properties of an object, that does not currently support constructor initialization. Yes? It fails silently as well. So you don't actually, you just get the default value even though you set it in your config file. This is really nasty. Yes, this is not a fully baked piece of code, I would say. Um, yeah, so that's that's not good. Out of curiosity, yes. so JSON.NET can very happily have a null value if it's missing in the JSON, right? So you deserialize in both JSON.NET, and presumably that will just pass a null into the constructor here, right? Which I mean, is perfectly valid, and I guess there's no safety against that, is there? Yes. Well, so that's a very good point. 
JSON.NET, generally speaking, will be perfectly happy to plug in a null value here unless you do something funky with custom deserialization. But if I had space on the slide, I would have written more here. You should actually test these things for null, which looks crazy because I said, can't be null, can't be null, can't be null. And then immediately go, if it is null, it's like, what? Why am I testing this non-nullable value for null? And the answer is, it might be invoked by a thing that has not done any nullable analysis. Your library might be used by someone who's not turned this feature on, and they can pass you a null. Or someone might deliberately pass you null exclamation mark. That's, that's probably, you know, that, that's their own stupid fault. But um, the JSON.NET example is a really good example of how you just can't necessarily rely on these things being enforced. As I said earlier, this is not a runtime feature. This is handled entirely at compile time. So anything that happens at runtime, such as a deserialization engine calling this thing for you, no tests apply. So the reality is that we actually generally would enforce it there. So if you want that constraint, you would actually do whatever your preferred syntax for checking that is, you know, whether you're using a sort of constraints library or just throwing it in line. But you would test them for null and say, OK, I want this to throw if any of this is not there. And then you will discover at deserialization time that you have a problem. And by the way, that is the reason also that you might write null exclamation mark. If you are working on the sort of project where it's a rule that you must get a certain level of code coverage and you are required to verify that your code throws exceptions when it should do, which uh, might be important if you're writing libraries that have a third party con consumption. It might be overkill for internal use, but it might be appropriate. How do you test that this constructor actually throws when it needs to? Because you can see it requires a null. That's when you use the null exclamation mark operator. Your unit test can say, I'm deliberately passing in a null when I know I'm not allowed to, to find out if it throws the exception it's supposed to. Yes? So in that case, when you define your properties as string, as, as, as nullable strings, and have your constructor as... You have preempted my next slide. <laughs> so, as I said, there are various ways to deal with this. Um, this is, if this works, this is preferable on the whole because this gives you correct by construction semantics. It means that basically, unless something is subverting the way things work, basically if you're able to construct the object, then you know it's going to be correct. So, um, so if, if you can do that, that's great. However, there are frameworks that don't support it, that one, and there will be others. Um, but also, a more fundamental problem is you can't always use this. How would you initialize a doubly linked list this way? You can't because there's a circular dependency there. And this can only be used to initialize tree-like structures. You can only use this technique if you have no cycles in your reference graph. So basically, this can't deal with circular references. The only way to initialize a circular reference is to create one of them, at least one of them first, and then plug them together afterwards. So, and this, by the way, means that even though Entity Framework does support this, you can't always use this on Entity Framework. Entity Framework does not support this for navigation properties, for example, largely for that reason. So sometimes there are data model issues that prevent you from using this. So, if you can, I would recommend this on the whole. We have found this to be the, the most pleasing solution, but it is not always possible, either for framework reasons or for data circular data reference references. The next tactic, which I like to call the long, hard slog. This is hard work, but it will actually work. This is what you were saying. We can make the field nullable and the property non-nullable. This is a means by which we can avoid the compiler error because the compiler would be perfectly happy that this is not initialized because we said that the field is nullable. And so it doesn't matter that the constructor doesn't initialize it. And the compiler's not going to complain about this not initializing anything because we've explicitly implemented this property. So there is nothing to be initialized by this. This is all code now. The compiler doesn't care about the backing field for the purposes of this thing. And then in here, well, what we've said here is if someone tries to get this thing and the property's not been set to a non-null value, then a mistake has been made. 
you're basically you're using you're attempting to do a thing with this object when this object is not in the state that enables you to do that thing. And we have an exception for that. It's called invalid operation exception. It says, OK, what you've done isn't necessarily wrong, but it's wrong now because this object is not in the right state for that. So that's an acceptable solution. And the flow control analysis will correctly determine that this just won't return if the field is null. So that's one way of doing it. And then in your setter, you, here's me enforcing that the argument coming in is not. So this works, and it gives you a way of enabling properties to be set after the object is constructed, and yet for those properties to guarantee that if they return something, it will definitely be null. And the exceptions are kind of the hole that enables that to happen. And I can see you wincing. Do you have something you would like to say, or are you? Uh, no, I'll leave it for them. <laughs> OK. So th this is definitely an option. Abandon hope. <laughs> Yeah, that's also an option. You can just say, do you know what? This is too difficult for this file. Or there's something about this that means that I'm using this in a context where nullability awareness is just never going to fly because I'm using a, an 18-year-old framework where the developer who wrote it has died, and, but we still need to use it. And for whatever reason, this is never going to be living in the world of nullable awareness. I'd rather just switch the language feature off for this bit of code, please. That, that's always an option. That might actually be the most sensible thing to do in certain cases. And this is where things like the hash nullable come in. You can control it at a more fine-grained level. Um, if you just stick this at the top of the file, it applies to the entire file. So that's an option. And, you, and if code uses stuff that's been marked this way, then all of the references are deemed to be oblivious. So it basically says, I don't know whether this is null or not, but I'm not going to cause warnings um, because I had to know it definitely might be null, and I don't know anything if you've got code like this. So that's an option. You could also do what the compiler suggests <laughs> and just say, yeah, yeah, it's null. Go on then. That's made my warning move somewhere else. Um, maybe it's someone else's problem now. Uh, I mean, you can do this. I would strongly recommend not doing this in most cases because um, you've sort of turned back on the semantics you had before the feature was there. You may as well just disable nullability anyway. The previous slide is better. Yes? But, uh, but does that actually express reality in that that could be null um, because it's loaded by JSON or something? You better watch out for this, and then the compiler will tell you that that's null, and you, you're using it in a way that might it should catch errors, right? So you do get the benefit as soon as you do that that the compiler will say, "Oh, dude, this might be null, and you might not have known about that." Isn't that a benefit? Well, it, it's I, the, what I dislike about that. I mean, yet yes, you could argue that this expresses a certain level of reality, which is that because this thing is being initialized after construction, there is a state it gets into where these things genuinely can, are expected to be null. Mm, my feeling is that the, 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 the reality is you shouldn't be using it in that state. I would argue that the reality is that if you've ended up using it in that state, you've made a mistake. And I think the right way to deal with that is for that mistake to become apparent, rather than to say, well, someone might have made this mistake, and now every single piece of code that uses that property has to live with the possibility of that mistake. Because that essentially is a restatement of the entire problem this is trying to solve. Except that I wouldn't be satisfied about finding out about it at runtime, which is what your previous implementation does. OK, so you, the, the one benefit you get from this is that you get warnings. The problem is most of those warnings are now spurious. So you're going to have, and actually it's going, to, it's going to pollute the code that consumes this. You're going to have loads of code in the consumer side that, that doesn't need to do what it's doing. It's, it's, I think it's the wrong response to the potential problem. So yeah. Um, so that's, that's why I personally would not recommend doing it this way. Could you say it's about you want to communicate the intent that this is not supposed to be null? Yes, just to repeat, you want to communicate the intent that this is not supposed to be null, just in case anyone at the back of the room didn't hear. But yes, absolutely, I completely I agree. I guess the real issue is that popular classes that are then populated through, um, from JSON data are eventually not null. Not, yeah. Anyway, it's not null. And there's nothing yeah. which allows you to say that this will eventually become not Jim, null. you're sort of saying, I know it's actually not, not going to be null. Don't yeah. worry about it. It's like when I, when I want to use it, 
I want it to be non plasma. That doesn't necessarily mean that in the life cycle of how it's populated, that it isn't plasma. Sure. I'm pretty sure it's not going to die. There, there, there is, yeah, I'm pretty sure, yes. There we go. <laughs> M most likely not null, new, new attributes. <laughs> You'll probably be fine. Uh, they're not the same thing, though. The, the difference is that in the first case, you're saying this really should never be null in normal use. That's very different from saying this might sometimes be null and it's okay if you check for it. And the uh, point in your configuration file, you would always say this should never be null in a, in a normal case. But if you haven't declared whether it's null or not, it might be that it's deliberately left null sometimes even after the application is initialized. And That's it's. The and it's specifically, this should never be null by the time you try to read the property. Yes. That, that's the key. It's like, yeah, it might be null, but by the time you try and read it, it shouldn't be. And that, that's, that's the thing. And, yeah. and, and I think it's just unhelpful to deal with that by just saying, well, it might be null. It's like, well, yeah. yeah but it, it here's another one I'd like to recommend you don't do. <laughs> Initialize it with huh, whatever. Random.next, you know. Um, so this, this will make the errors go away. <laughs> but all you've really done is, is introduced a different, and once again, introduced a different form of the problem you started with. So um, it's really tempting to set, it's just I'm going to set that to a null string because I know, know the real one will be along in a minute. It works. Um, and, and actually, in cases where it definitely will be initialized, it works relatively well. The problem is you lose the ability to detect that you made a mistake. And so here, we just put a plug the value in. And this really only works with strings because there's a handy value that's not null, but that still means nothing that we can use as the obvious default, um, which is an empty string. But remember the entire problem. It is that today we have these properties which have a value except when they don't have a useful value. This is just the same thing. It's just the non-useful value now is a different name. It's string.empty or quote, quote, rather than null. So this, this is not really better than disabling nullability. However, occasionally, this might be the most pragmatic way of moving forward. Because it might be that you have really strong reasons to know that actually it's going to be OK in reality. Somehow, I don't know what those might be, but maybe you know, because you've got tests that verified or whatever, that this actually is always going to be initialized eventually, and that this is less work than doing it the other way, and there's no real benefit to doing it the hard way, so you may as well do this. And in a sense, that makes this on the same moral footing as the dammit operator, because that's exactly the same thing. That's you saying, trust me, it'll be fine. I, I don't want you helpful checks. I don't want you to tell me I've made a mistake. Um, I know I'm right, because that never goes wrong for developers, does it? Um, so it, it's, uh, if the exclamation mark operator is allowed to exist, this, this is certainly allowed to exist as well, and should be used with equal caution. So it is a possibility. And that basically is all the options. So if you can declare things as nullable, if that's the right thing to do, where you can't, I think, it's my opinion, that um, cor correct by construction is the way to do it. I would say that because I also use F-sharp, and that's the way they do it there. It's the way Haskell does it. It's, it seems to be a dependable approach because it makes it much harder to get into a, um, a nonsensical state. If you say to make one of these at all, it's got to be right, then that just rules out certain classes of errors. However, completely broken for circular references. So you might need to do other things. And so either possibly punt like this if, if you really, really think you can get away with it, um, or the long, hard slog, basically, is the other way of doing it. You haven't written the Roston analyzer to rewrite to make the long, hard slog easier yet? I have not come across <laughs> an analyzer to do this yet. Um, or the other thing someone could do is a Roslyn code gen thing that takes an interface to code like this and then backfills it for you, or an abstract property. Just a few more things then, just uh, things you'll probably run into. Generics, as I mentioned earlier, are problematic in this world because the reality of retrofitting this 20 years after the runtime was invented means that there's a certain lack of symmetry here. Uh, nullable things are different if they are value types compared to how they are if they are nullable reference types. So what's T question mark? Well, it depends on whether T is a class or a struct. The code the compiler generates is different depending on whether it's a nullable reference 
or a nullable value. Someone earlier said, couldn't we just call has value on this or dot value on that? Well, yes, if it's a nullable reference type, because nullable of t has those properties. But no, if it's a reference, sorry, nullable value type. But no, if it's a nullable, if, if it's a nullable reference, because it's just a reference. It doesn't have all those properties and members that nullable of t has. The, the, the IL is different. So you cannot have one method generated for an unknown type t that is able to correctly handle t question mark unless you know whether it's a class or a struct. This has certain implications. Here is a function with a single generic type argument, type parameter, t, and it returns that. And rather arbitrarily, it's... Um, Actually, this is a real example. I, th I thought I'd made this up. No, this is a real example from SpecFlow, as it happens. Um, and so this is basically digging something out of the SpecFlow scenario context. And if it's not there, it wants to return default of t. And you get a warning. A default expression introduces a null value when t is a non-nullable reference type. OK. So what do we do about that? How do we make it OK to return this? Because for any specific type we could plug in for t, this code is fine. You can write this for int, int question mark, string, string, not string, sorry, string question mark. The only thing you can't do it for is non-nullable reference types. Anything else, this is valid for. So how do we constrain this so that we're allowed to do that? The first thing you will try is this. I'll just stick a question mark there. This doesn't work because that means two completely different things depending on whether t turns out to be a reference type or a value type. It would literally have to generate completely different code for the, well, not completely different, somewhat different code, different IL for those two cases. So that does not work, sadly. A nullable type parameter must be known to be a value type or non-nullable reference type. Consider adding a class struct or type constraint. Another example of the compiler telling you to do the wrong thing. So someone actually came to me in the break with precisely this problem, and they had done exactly what the compiler had help, unhelpfully told them to do, which is understandable. You'd think the compiler would know what it was talking about. Um, but it, it's problematic, because you end up with two versions of the function. One, if you want to support both classes and structs, you go, right, now I need two of these. So you write two, then you discover you can't actually overload on that, so you have to give them different names. It's just a, just a mess. It's horrible. So this is not good. And you're all waiting for the next slide that shows the beautiful, elegant, perfect solution. Don't get your hopes too high. You can deal with it. I mean, this does work, but this is, this is no good. You, you can just say, this is always a class. And actually, sometimes that's the easiest way thing to do. Sometimes you don't really need to support value types, and maybe this will work for you, in which case, this is the easiest way out of the problem. This just works. Um, oh, by the way, there's class as a value, as a constraint, defaults to non-nullable. There's also now a class question mark constraint if you want to allow <laughs> the type arguments to be a possibly null reference type. Um, and there's also where struct. So you can write either, and the code's fine, but you can't have one piece of code be both. So what do we do in practice? Well, if you can use the constraint do, it's easier. Otherwise, you have to use a mixture of the attributes I showed you earlier to say, I know I, you know, I told you this, but actually it's that. And I couldn't tell you the reality because you can't write the right syntax without getting an error. So you just use an attribute instead. And then the compiler will correctly do the right thing when you plug in an actual type argument. And you will end up having to use the null forgiving operator as well inside your code to get it to compile. So it's just a bit of a mess, sadly. But at least it is fixable. So we are on to the miscellaneous at the end of my talk now, but just some things worth knowing about. So yes, just a few more things to be aware of. These are just practical things. Sometimes you implement comparison. It's not just i equatable of t. It's also just this.equals. Uh, do you make it nullable or not? And the answer is yes, you do. Because the general presumption throughout all existing .NET code is that you're allowed to pass in null uh, when you're calling something .equals. So that's just, it's people, it, this is sort of, you trip across and go, mm, what do I do here? But yes, just, just say this is always allowed to be null. That's the way to deal with it. Um, also, finally, I have a reason for insisting on one of my pet peeves. So. When you cast, this slide is badly laid out for this room. 
That says prefer old fashioned cast with parentheses over as foo. So don't use an as cast unless you mean an as cast. This has always bugged me slightly for years, but I've never quite been able, to, been able to put my finger on why. Some people just prefer as. I think they see it as a gentler, kinder kind of cast that's less violent than. It's a huge performance benefit to it. A huge performance benefit? Yes, to use as foo because the foo will throw. And, yes. And that causes a big performance penalty, whereas the as foo doesn't. Only if the as is valid. <laughs> the case I'm complaining about is where people do an as and then immediately dereference the thing, yes. which will then throw oh, yeah, yeah. the wrong exception. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. So when the two are interchangeable, because it was going to throw anyway, yes. I should have qualified that. Uh, so if you're doing an as and then immediately using the thing or just assuming that it's null, loads of people do this, and I've never really understood why. Sorry? You should use is. If you're going to do that as, oh, no, not no, don't no, 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 find the one, you should, you should probably explicitly express it. You're checking if it's of this type and then do the cast. Yes, you can do an is style pattern match, yeah. uh, unless it's wrong for it not to be the type. The but I just mean it's not, it's not an efficiency case because you should never have written it that way in the first place. Yes, OK, yes. Um, so this is specifically the case where you expect the cast to succeed, is what I'm talking about, and yet you've written an as anyway. Stop doing that, because now it's definitely a problem, because now you'll run into null problems. Because it will go, well, this thing might be null. You can't use it. Whereas if you do this, the compiler knows that the cast either succeeds or it throws. So if, if it didn't throw, you've definitely got a non-null value so it can proceed. So if you are writing as today for casts you, fully ex you require to succeed, stop now, because you'll have fewer problems when you come to port your code over. This is a thing I had to go and fix a few things of in our code base because other people had done this. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's it. Um, so to sum up, when you are considering moving over, uh, decide what ta your targets are because that actually has an impact on how things are going to work. And if you are going to target, do, do you need to target dot my standard 2.0? You might be targeting it today. Do you still need to? Will you still need to in six months' time? It might actually be worth just deferring this until you can say our entire world is .NET Core 3.1. If you are able to do that, life will be simpler. So that's a consideration as to the timing of this sort of project. Um, then once you've decided you are going to go ahead and do it, I would recommend mostly starting from the lazy or dependency tree, but be prepared to revisit as you learn more about what you should have done as you start to use the results. Find the things that truly are nullable and mark them as such. Use the attributes to enable the compiler to infer as much as it possibly can about what is null and what is not. With properties, correct by construction is often preferable, but there are alternatives if you need them. Explicit implementation may be the, the most flexible fallback. Okay, well, thank you very much.